Okay. We're live now. Awesome. Um, well, thanks everyone for, uh, for waiting in the waiting room and, uh, and for joining us today live. Um, we've got a, a really fun one uh, today for you. I'm, I'm just really excited to, to dive into this. Uh, we've got our, our very own Hunter Elmore with us. He's our automotive design consultant. He's incredible. Um, I've done a, 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 quite a number of these lives, and so has Hunter uh, at this point. Um, you've done a few of these now. And really the goal with these is just to get in the product, make some, make some cool stuff, make some relevant stuff, and hopefully inspire all of you out there to, uh, to, to drive your projects further and maybe give you some new tools on, um, on how you can approach your projects in Gravity Sketch and beyond, um, you know, beyond Gravity Sketch, you know, other, other workflows and ways of thinking through your ideas. So obviously today we are focusing on the Dune universe and, uh, I'm really excited about this. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, you know, obviously Dune Part 2 just came out and there's been a lot of buzz around it. And we thought it'd just be really cool to design some assets around the Dune universe that uh, we didn't see in the films. And so you're welcome to shout out your ideas as well in the comments. I'll be reading those periodically. And uh, you're welcome to put your ideas out there. We'll take those into um, consideration and, and let's just make it a big collaborative design session. Um, yeah, so I'm really excited. Uh, Hunter, do you just want to like introduce yourself really quickly? Just, uh, you know, for those of you that haven't met Hunter before or seen Hunter yeah. before yet. Yeah. So, hey, everybody. My name is Hunter Elmore. I'm an automotive design consultant with Gravity Sketch. I work with a lot of our uh, industry clients and show them how to use the tool, how to implement it into different workflows. My background is kind of a mixture of automotive, industrial design, medical devices, uh, kind of all over the place. And with that, I've, I've learned a lot of different tools. A connection issue. Anybody I've been using it for a while. Okay. Sweet. You kind of cut out there for me for a minute. I don't know if there might have been a gap. But um, I think we got the gist of it. Can you hear me okay. still, Hunter? Yes, I can. Okay, cool. Yeah, I think we just dipped out for a sec. But it seems to be all good. Uh, but thank you, Hunter. Yes, really appreciate you being here. And um, this is going to be a really fun one. Um, let's just dive, let's just briefly talk and then let's just get right into it. Hunter, what are you thinking about today for your, for your idea? Yeah. yeah I mean, we were talking about the idea of kind of like a, a new, my, uh, I don't want to say micro mobility, but like new smaller individual based vehicle. And what I wanted to sketch on with that was the idea of taking the still suit that they kind of have and have developed in the, the storyline and in kind of the situation uh, and, and in the world building. And right now that's kind of not really built for traveling high speeds with like open air or anything like that. So my thought was it would be kind of a cool story if they retrieved like wreckage of ornithopters and the Fremen were taking that, using that paneling that's been optimized for this kind of environment and building out almost like additional armor plating for their still suits so that they can travel at faster speeds, open air, and not have to worry about being, you know, destroyed by the sand and everything that's kicked up in the air. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, they, I think we're taking like this sort of, um, you know, mashed together approach uh, with the Fremen. Uh, so yeah, my, mine attaching to that is a similar approach in that I think it'd be cool to have this more like smaller mobility or micro mobility, like you said, um, vehicle, kind of like a bike um, that the Fremen have constructed that allows them to quickly move across the, the desert. Obviously their form of travel is the, is the worms. We know that, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh this could be like another, maybe like aggressive, um, more, more like warfare, you know, piece of technology that they've developed based off of just, you know, like what you said, taking parts from the Harkonnens or the, uh, Atreides, uh, ornithopters and making their own stuff. And so, yeah, that's kind of the design direction for today. And yeah, if anybody else has any ideas out there, we're we're welcome to welcome to take those. So, yeah, let's just get right into it. Um, sure. What I'll do is I'm gonna start working on some volumes. I'm gonna talk through my thought process, but also Hunter, like, you know, feel free to share your thought process too while you're working. I'll also come over and just like observe for a bit too, um, and we can just kind of like ping pong a little bit like that. 
it's uh sure. it's it's always a little tricky you know with multiple people in collab just to make sure everybody sees everything but i think that we'll get a good balance so uh yeah let's just get right into it so yeah sounds um, good i i'll go ahead and start and just kind of mm -hmm. like explain my thought process here um like i mentioned you know these vehicles especially the house of trades you know aesthetic you'll notice that it's very like polygonal it's very low poly um very very rudimentary forms if you look at their ships even like their large carrier ships um, you'll see a lot of polygonal shapes so i really want to reflect that um in the aesthetic of of the bike uh, and that's that's you know that's going to be natural because you know that's what the Fremen are going to be pulling from. However, they may be pulling some pieces from Harkonnen hardware as well, which is actually a little bit different. Harkonnen hardware is a little bit slightly more organic in aesthetic, also very harsh and um, and rough looking. But I think the best way to start is to just start with some polygonal. Um, some polygonal shapes here and I have uh, the best way I can think of is just using the low poly tool and I'm going to put the mirror turn the mirror on um, we have this mannequin here for reference for scale and obviously you can see Hunter is already starting to sketch um, some basic uh, basic lines around the figure just to get uh, an idea of some shapes that he wants to create and so I'm actually going to use the figure as sort of a, a rough reference for uh, for scale. And I'm going to build it out away uh, sort of in front so that I'm not in the way of uh, Hunter's work. But then later what we'll do, I think, is we can um, combine these two together and uh, yeah, get a good sense of things. So like I said, like very polygonal shapes. Um, I honestly think that I... I can reflect the form of the original ornithopter design. And, you know, I think at this point, it's really pretty free form. Like it doesn't have to, we don't have to be super precious with things. Some major elements that I'm thinking of with this vehicle is obviously the front end, you know, is, is probably gonna be very polygonal but we also have um, some other elements. Uh, these might be like secondary elements, but you know we have probably will have like a sort of a a lighting fixture here in the front, and probably some guns um, on the sides that that sort of jet forward. And you'll notice that uh, the ornithopter kind of does a similar thing. And so I'm just going to kind of push and pull these shapes around and see if we can get to something that some get to something that's kind of compelling and you'll notice I'm not being again I'm not being very precious with how any of this really connects I'm just trying to block in the basic basic shapes next thing we obviously have like you know the area where the rider is going to be sitting. I always forget how difficult this is to do live, but it's a good ch it's a good challenge. <laughs> it's a, it's definitely sure. a good challenge. Let's see here. So I think you know we want to actually have some instrument panels at some point. And the Dune universe I notice is like very basic technologically um there's not a whole lot of digital um you know digital technology being shown i mean i think it's implied that some things are pretty digital but uh you know i actually have a little bit of understanding behind that i don't know if you've how how deep you've de you've delved into the uh the dune world hunter but um, I've, I've looked up some of my quick questions online and gotten some pretty interesting answers. I have not read the books, yeah, uh, but I know that they, I've heard that they have a lot more detail than is shown in the movies. I think that kind of like pseudo 
almost apocalyptic vibe where they have high technology, but not it's not integrated into everything yeah. is a pretty cool mix of like the sci-fi side of it, things that are believable because sure, there is some level of higher technology, but uh, there's a reason why it's not integrated at every little nuanced piece of, of life like we're used to. Yeah, it sim- so it sounds like you already kind of know where I'm headed with that, which is um, apparently, you know, in the in the Dune universe, um, the reason why there's not super advanced technology, you know, integrated with everything is, I guess, humanity had basically a a, a, a war with with AI essentially, um, where they created artificial artificial intelligence. And there was a war that lasted like a long time. I don't remember like how much, how long it said it was, but there was a war. And then eventually the humans won the war and almost kind of like in a religious way, like it was written in stone that like no human should create technology in its own likeness or create, uh, I don't exactly remember what the quote is, but it's something like that. Like, you know, to not create, um, technology that is like a human and so that's why everything was reverted to like a little bit more like rudimentary technology um i just thought that was so fascinating and it definitely shows in the uh in the aesthetic of the of the movies um, which i'm really happy they like uh i'm really happy that they like stuck with that and it's actually the same reason why they use um a similar reason why they use swords a lot and not uh, like firearms or why our firearms are considered um, a more serious form of uh, weaponry and definitely not taken lightly, um, which I thought was really cool. But it's, uh, yeah, it's pretty interesting. And just as a reminder for everybody watching, if you got any questions just on the product, Gravity sketch, we're happy to answer. That is super cool, though. Just like that that world building. I love the nuance of that. That's probably my favorite part of sci-fi in general is all of the things that you notice, there's some sort of backstory there, but they don't necessarily tell you, right, like off the bat, right? They don't lay it out for you in these new movies or anything like that in a way that's super immediately digestible. It adds to the nuance of the storytelling and builds everything out from there. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely makes it a lot more, um, and it gives a lot more meaning to it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, there's a reason why things are the way they are. Okay, I'm going to move this. Probably some kind of like. So I'm imagining something kind of like this. And then I mentioned before, I thought maybe. Similar to the ornithopters, that um, you know there would be, you know, essentially there'd be wings, you know, and you know they would kind of come out out of the sides. Like this. And then basically is like a mini ornithopter essentially you know it's like it's still got that uh still has that sort of dragonfly type of uh shape to it let's see if we can divide that just trying to find like an interesting silhouette i think we have just have like a little sphere here because there's like these little so that's like attempt number one and so I'm going to move that way out in the distance digging it that's cool it's just like 
this is the ugly sketches, you know, this is like the stuff that you just like, I got to get it out, get it yeah. out of my head and then see if we can get it to a place. Yeah. One of the things, uh, back when I was at Nerf, um, I was actually my first design job as an intern, but one of the things that we would do is we would ideate on all the blasters side view. And one thing that, uh, Maddie, my manager at the time, he was always big on was doing silhouette studies. So like one thing that I kind of carried over that we would do in Photoshop where we would just start with lasso tool and make a bunch of random shapes and kind of view it from straight ortho views. And that format of like ideating and thinking of general, like interesting silhouettes yeah. is still something that I'll use in here sometimes. Like if I, if I'm stuck or I'm lost on one specific part and I want to get back to like the core of what that overall gesture is, I'll just turn on my flat material and use the volume tool and kind of just blast in random surfaces, not even worrying about tessellation or anything like that, but just trying to get a feel of the overall volume. Yeah, that's honestly an awesome technique. Um, because the nice thing that silhouettes do is it truly gets rid of all like detail. It's like, yeah. it's pure silhouette. It's just like, what is the, is this a nice shape or is this not a pleasing shape? Um, and even like, I'm just thinking about like some of the ships in the Dune, Dune films. Um, if anybody out there has even has, has looked at them as well, a lot of them are pretty like potato shaped, you know? And, but still it's a very, it's the, the, I think the principle applies, the silhouette applies. It's like, it's like a, it's kind of like a potato shape, but it's meant to be like imposing and almost a little bit alien in, the, in this way. Um, and I think that was the intention of the, the designers on the film is, is to make it feel strange. And there's something strange about like, almost like a, almost like a like formless, a little bit. yeah, almost like a weird formless, like shape, um, for, yeah, very for like a flying ship. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, uh, yeah, it's really interesting. And I think that uh, it's a great exercise, like what Hunter was explaining there, to try and find something interesting. I'm going to check comments real quick, too, and see. Um, yeah, go for it. Where did you get the HDRI? Oh, yeah, good question. Yeah, so someone asked about the HDRI. It's a great question. Um, yeah, I was actually trying to work this out myself because I wanted to find an HDRI that felt kind of like the Dune environment. Um, this is a little more rocky, and I think there's even some desert plants <laughs> in, the, in the background. But um, this HDRI, I, I actually edited it in Photoshop and nice. changed the sky. So originally it was blue, but it needed to be, it needed to feel a little more deserty. So. Um, what you can do is actually you can just download the EXR file, edit the colors in Photoshop, and then you need to convert it back to HDR. And then you'll be able to just drop that file into your local headset, or you can drop it into, um, you can drop it into landing pad and you'll be able to access the HDRI files when you uh, jump into VR. So if you go here, I can just show you all. Um, if you're in VR, just go over here to settings go over to workspace and then you'll see here some presets for environments just click on the hdri one and then there'll be a slider and so if you slide it all the way to the right to custom environments there's a few different sources you can pull from with this hdr source so some of them are obviously reference library local personal it kind of divides it up and then you click this drop down and it'll show you some different options and uh, you can just pick the HDRIs that you've uh, you've downloaded, and then we have some preloaded ones as well. Another cool thing is we have this gumdrop uh, thing that we added that we didn't actually always have. That really kind of like flattens the ground of the HDR, which makes it really feel like you're in a place rather than just kind of like hovering in a uh, you know in in sort of a non gravity non non-grounded uh environment so i think the ground drop helps a lot especially when we really start getting stuff going let's get stuff going here okay i'm yeah. just going to continue forward 
see if we can get to something compelling. I really like these silhouettes that you did here. I'm probably going to pull from some of that, to be honest, Hunter. Go for it. Um, really, really liking that. I, um, I have four wings, but honestly, I know you're probably just doing a quick sketch, but I almost think that, like, well, no, I did. I had, oh, yeah, I had eight. So you have, like, four, and I, I know you're probably just doing, like, a quick sketch, but I think, like, there's something really cool about a fewer number of wings on this vehicle specifically. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lean into that. Cool. And it could be interesting, too. Like, right now, they're all sketched up up front. But, like, thinking about just the way that it might need to be structured for center of mass or something. Like, maybe you've yeah. got somebody laying down kind of in this section here or maybe this like lower one kind of offsets so you've got like a, a far front and a far back i think it yeah. loses a little bit of that like dragonfly-esque ornithopter look when you do that but it is yeah. kind of interesting yeah it's and i wish i knew i wish i i bet if i knew a little bit more of the dune universe i probably would be able to make a design design decision there and say okay this is what a fremen would do you know yeah. Um, but I don't know. <laughs> I'd probably stick with the dragonfly aesthetic just because I think that makes the most sense. It might be the most derivative, but you know, we only, we don't, we don't have a lot of time. So I, I guess I'm trying to just make quick decisions. I also like the idea of like having a wing, you know, some of the wings back and then maybe like almost like there's a dive mode that it goes into, which I think is kind of a cool idea. Um, so we're going to play with all that. All right. I'm going to stop talking and start sketching <laughs> well i'm gonna keep talking a little bit but let's Talk see and sketch. yeah and if anybody else has any questions um just feel free to post it in the comments i'll be periodically checking and i'll uh, after a little bit i'll come over and check out your stuff hunter and see how you're doing um cool. okay so let's change it's really cool, by the way, too, when you make the material like reflective, because you really can see like um, the HGRI reflections, which is I think yeah. really cool. That's where the HGRI really shines is when you turn on those reflections, and it just changes the way everything looks. Yeah, like that's the, that's the big benefit of having as an HGRI and not just a backplate image, right? Yeah, exactly. Gonna get rid of that and then we're going to i'm gonna take a piece of this yeah i probably should have started with the volume tool honestly i think that that like is getting my brain going with with some ideas more so than the the polygons I started with. Yeah, um, I'm a I'm a huge fan of the volume tool. Um, name, I mean, mostly because of like my first design experience having been at Nerf and uh, Maddie, who I worked with, was really big on like just silhouette exploration, right and, and trying to get through those main ideas and to what you were talking about earlier about like the, the monolithic form of the way that they're actually designing, or I guess the design theory or, or themes of those different ships in Dune, there's something really interesting about starting off with just a super basic form. Like Dune kind of follows through on that uh, Griebel format of, of making visual interest where you start with a, a relatively simple or pure shape and then you can make it look like it has function simply by uh, just adding a lot of details. Yeah. And the more nuanced and, and thought through those details are, the more capturing of a design it is. But at the end of the day, like those details can be applied to really any, any shape and uh, provide some sort of story behind it. So starting with that overall theme of the volume is just, really fun like that, that was kind of our thought process there is that we had the vents and like the grip textures and the color breaks that made 
nerf what it was. And then we would create a volume that was interesting and fun and cool that kids would like. And then we applied those brand language cues to that volume, which is kind of the same idea with sci-fi doing those greeble effects on top of a very simplified form. Yeah, that's, um, I mean, ditto, honestly, I don't really have much to add to that. I mean, you, you really said it. Um, it's, uh, it is, I mean, <clears throat> you know, you just think about like, you know, the days of like the original Star Wars films, you know, that's what they were doing. You know, they were, you know, how trying to make a, a universe that was believable. And, you know, they really started with, you know, pretty simple forms, um, you know, at their core. And then the Greebles, you know, as you put it, um, came from like, you know, tank tank kits and a lot of like military vehicle kits that they would use to add detail to the ships and make them feel, you know, make them feel believable, make them feel grounded. And, um, and it, and it really worked. It worked. I mean, it was, it, it, it was like nothing had anyone had ever seen before and truly like a, uh, a, a great design process because it was like, you don't have to, but what, but what was cool though, is I was watching a video on this and, you know, I could be wrong, but I think the designers that, you know, the, the creators that were working on those films, they still tried to have like a logic behind every detail they added, you know, like maybe this is like a vent that, you know, it needs to let out some exhaust for like this, you know, portion of the, of the vehicle. And I just love that, you for know, sure. because it's like, if you can at least have some sort of logic, you know, you're going to have so much more believability behind, you know, what you're creating. Obviously we're talking about things that don't exist. Um, you know, this is obviously a different process if you're creating something that is going to be actually, actually created, which in, ca in that case you need, it needs to serve a function, but, um, you know, just like in the world of, I think entertainment, having some kind of logic is better than just creating like something that looks cool. And I've, I've seen both, like I've seen it in films where I felt like they were just kind of creating something that just kind of looked cool. And, and it does look yeah. cool. It does look very compelling and believable, but, or it does look, you know, it's striking, but it's like, I don't know if I fully connect with it because it, it didn't seem like it had a lot of thought into it, put into it, you know, from a functional standpoint. Um, For sure. and yeah, I think that that's like what really brings it home as well. Um, yeah, I completely agree. I think a lot of like, especially when I'm working with, uh, students or, or people who are newer to that idea of like detailing, a lot of times people will throw things on there because they're like aesthetically pleasing and they don't really have a story behind it. Yeah. And if you don't have a story behind it, it, that's the whole point of all of this, right? Especially in the entertainment industry is to build out that story, yeah. um, to build out more of what's going on. And if something is there with no reason, it's like, and then that's prevalent in pretty much every industry. Um, in in yeah. automotive, especially, there was this trend for like, the, in the early 2000s for about 10 or 15 years where people would add vents as visual details that didn't actually vent anything. <laughs> and uh, like that's that became a very polarizing topic uh among professionals and people in the industry because it's like oh i never want to see a vent without it became such a negative thing even if it wasn't even if it was something simple right like a very simplified just indentation looking like a vent it's like well what's the point of it right why is it there yeah um and if it's not there to you know you could say oh it draws back to an older model where we had a vent there and now it's just a visual detail like that makes sense but if you're just adding it there because you can't think of anything else to do. That's not very strong design, right? Yeah, and that's a perfect, that's a great point. Yeah, I actually remember that too. Yeah, I think I had some portfolio reviews when I was a freshman or sophomore where I had a design that had those vents in there. So that's why I'm so familiar with it <laughs> because I got roasted by some people that I, that I looked up to and I still do look up to because they're like just so aware of, of that sentiment. It's the same idea with like transparent aluminum and things like that in automotive where it's, it can be really cool, but if you're doing it just to, because 
you don't know what else to do, that is where it becomes a problem. Yeah. Absolutely. Make this. Okay, I feel like I'm onto something. I'm gonna. I'm not loving the C area yet, but I think I'm onto something. I'm gonna take a pause, and I'm just gonna come over to where you are, Hunter, and have a look at what you're doing. Um, yeah. Awesome. This is sweet. Thanks. Yeah, basically what, I, what I've been doing is I started with that rougher uh, kind of just line work that I've got down here. And then this is definitely at a phase of not necessarily execution, but just trying to get thoughts out and trying to understand what my volume is actually doing. Uh, because right now, like a lot of these surfaces aren't even connected. And that's where I see most of the value from Gravity Sketch just personally and as a designer and where it fits into my workflow is not just from an execution level, but from a, an intent finding level, right? Like the fact that I can build all these surfaces and some of it's connected, some of it is completely disconnected. I can use that to think through different colorways and, and different panel gaps and things like that helps me a lot to just find my intent. Uh, and it's the same idea as 2D sketching, right? Just with more context. And I think that's what's so fun about it is you don't lose the creativity associated with just taking a piece of paper and blasting in surfaces. You still have that, but with a bit more uh, context and a bit more finesse and more intent being followed through on. Yeah, this is awesome. This is great. So like right now, I'm just throwing in a kind of material cut there, even though it's not actually all watertight and, and filled up or anything like that, it's still there. And then now that I have my main surfaces down, I might come in with a volume tool and just start to uh, kind of blast in some of these others. Well, we've got some, uh, got a few comments. I'm gonna see if I can read few here. We keep adding more control to the mannequins available in Gravity Sketch. Love that functionality and use it for illustration reverence. Um, what kind of control would you like, uh, Lewis? Definitely would love to, to know more. Um, we definitely want to make improvements on the mannequin. There's definitely been, um, we've wanted to make some updates to it and I think we will at some point in the future. Um, there's nothing fast for getting a large composition with many characters, right? A true game changer. We keep adding more control to the mannequins available in Gravity Sketch. Um, yeah, whatever kind of control you're looking for, Lewis, let us know. Um, and then we've got Gabe Bolas. Oh, Gabe. Gabe was a colleague of mine in school. Gabe's in the comments. Yeah, Let's Gabe, uh, I think he was my capstone professor. There we go. Awesome. Good to see you, Gabe. Yeah. One of the most impressive aspects of the design in Dune were how well thought out a lot of the details was, dealing, detailing was, felt real. There's like, an, there's like an icon covering that word, but felt sensible in the context of the world. Absolutely agree. Absolutely agree with that. Yeah, good to see you, Gabe. Glad you could join us. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. This is looking really awesome. All right. I got to figure out the seat because this is not, I'm not, I must need to like, just get rid of stuff so I can see clearly. to come up I almost need to do something different here for a seat I think it almost needs to be a little bit of sub D because it's kind of a softer form 
think that we just need to show that it can still be pretty rudimentary. I hope uh, Nick Gravely's not watching because he's gonna be, he's gonna be uh, frustrated with my bike, bike seat workflow here. <laughs> Are you doing that right now? Just the main form of the seat? Yeah, just trying to create like a, just like a really simple seat shape that I think would work. Or maybe Nick Gravely, hopefully you are watching, they can give you some tips. Okay, we'll probably just keep it at that. I think what I've learned to come, come comfortable with, uh, with these lives is, you know, this is, it's not always a pretty process, you know? I mean, this is the pretty raw this is the raw design process, and that's why we really want to do these lives. Is we want to show we want to show the, you know, the real thinking that goes behind just like trying to create something. Um, For sure. And you know, it's it's really not it's really not that good looking, you know, most of the way through until uh, until you arrive on something until it starts to really solidify um, at, a, at a certain point but until you get there it's you know hold on <laughs> <laughs> I think that's I think it's where we have like kind of a really nice solution though is, is the fact that it doesn't it's not as oh what's the right word the stakes aren't as high right yeah. like it has that same feel of sketching on paper um, where it's a sketch for the designer, right? And it's, and it's truly about communication and yeah. collaboration with other people and less about trying to get some, like, technically perfect result. You don't have to do that. Uh, like, you certainly can, right? It's a, especially with the subdivision workflows, there is topology and, and all sorts of things where we can get really nuanced and in the weeds if we wanted to but the beauty of the tool is the fact that you don't have to right you can retain that that rough sketchbook kind of feeling and do it in a way that when you're done with your sketch you don't have to then go in and like interpret that into 3d or go down some rabbit hole of okay what does this mean now uh it can translate directly which is what I think is like the, the coolest part is that it's a little bit easier to get from A to B to whatever else you want to do. I, I a hundred percent agree. It really, it does like, I don't know if you just said it, but it, yeah, it takes that pressure off. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I mean, you really said it there. It's just kind of like it, it, it takes you it takes you between those those really difficult moments of just kind of like thinking through something you know absolutely absolutely i know uh michael who is a ford he's been a huge comp proponent of gravity sketch for a long time uh when i was interning with him on his team like he always talks about the shift especially in students and in people who haven't really like built that muscle memory to think in 3d yet on mm -hmm. how big of a shift it can actually be uh, because if you start off i mean imagine the first time you're sketching something for industrial design you have to learn perspective you have to learn uh, all these various things line weight and a lot of that is translated or transferable to these different tools like gravity sketch but the fact that you can hop into an environment, and especially now with pass-through, 
it's it's as powerful as ever because you can just jump in here, uh, sketch something, and you're already in 3D. You're already thinking that way. You already are looking at the surface and the way it translates and the way it rolls around. You don't have to do any sort of mental acrobatics to get to that result. Um, you just naturally think through it. Yeah, I, I sometimes forget. Um, I honestly sometimes forget. I know and I'm not trying to make this like, well, I'll just, I'll just explain myself. Like I, I really, really forget sometimes when I'm in this tool, how, um, what I'm work, what I'm trying to think through that if I were doing it like in front of a screen, like in a 2d, you know, if I was looking at a 2d, 2d tool, I'm not, I'm not putting down any 2d tools. It's just that there would be so many more angles I'd have to be considering through my thought process. Um, or, or just there'd be, there'd be a lot more items in my decision-making process just for the sheer fact that I'm looking at something on a, on a flat screen, um, that being in here allows me to just not even have to worry about some of that because I can just take my hand and just grab it and look at it, you know, from all the angles and sides that I want. And then I'm done with it. You know, then I can just, you know, put it back exactly where it was before. And I think that's yeah. just a super powerful, um, I mean, very, uh, I think, indispensable uh, way to just kind of think. Yeah, absolutely. That, that absolutely. Sense, I think but... it's, no, I think that makes a lot of sense because it's all about figuring things out, right? Like the, the field of 3D design is a really fascinating thing because it's taking nothing and creating something physical. And to warp your brain to think that way uh, of, of starting with nothing, starting with a vague empty space and create something from it. Like, even if it's not the best design in the world, like that's still an accomplishment in itself just to be able to do that. And uh, like, it, it's just so much more, it's so much easier, right? It just feels more natural when you're in the 3D space and you don't have to think in your head, you don't have to do any of that. Like, I used to have this thing where I would sit at my desk and I was sketching in Photoshop or in Procreate. And those are like amazing tools for visualization and, and communicating intent. But I would do a sketch and then I would uh, say I was working on a car. I'd have to turn it three quarters and think about the back. And I'd sit there and kind of like tap my pen against my head and wonder, okay, is this actually going to translate or am I drawing something that's physically impossible? And if I am, that's gonna make life a lot harder down the road yeah. And you still figure it out, right? Like you'll still get to that point where the result comes forward uh, and, and you've found a solution, but I'd certainly prefer to find that solution long before I have to. And I think that's where, where this comes into play is that it's just a little bit earlier on in the process and it alleviates a lot of that concern that I used to have over, okay, how would I actually resolve this? How would I um, address this piece of surface, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, that's a really great point. Um, it just, it, it gets a lot of that headache out of the way early on. Yeah, truly. Okay. I'm going to explain a little bit of my thought process here. I think what I'm thinking is possibly that this bike kind of has like a bit of a belly to it because, you know, at, at times I'm thinking that it's going to need to be resting on the sand or something. And, you know, it might need to, you know, cause I'm trying to think of how it sits, you know, when it's not, um, you know, when it's not in the air or when it's not yeah. in use. And I think that it's probably going to be like, I almost, I almost don't want to give it any kind of stand or any legs. Cause I feel like it's that rudimentary. Like it's, it's literally that primitive where they've like put, they've like hodgepodge this thing together to, to the point where it's like, they just kind of, 
they just kind of get on top of it. It's already just kind of sitting down and they just kind of lean it over. You know, you almost like they get on it and they lean it over upright and then it just kind of starts going and maybe kind of drags on the sand a little bit, you know, as it gets going. And I think that's kind of cool. Um, makes it feel a little bit more rugged and, and raw of a, of a machine. Yeah. And uh, I'm trying to see if I can communicate that in form a bit here. At some point, my intention with this is, um, is that I want to, uh, I want to translate these sub D shapes into, or sorry, I want to translate these volume shapes into some sub D. I'm not going to go crazy into sub D surfacing with this because we don't have a lot of time, but I would like to do a little bit of refinement with that and get into some of the smaller details. So we've got something that, that makes sense by the end. Um, sure. And I'm just kind of thinking out loud. Let's see here. I'm going to look at the comments because we've got a few. I'm going to have read through some of these. There is a specific mannequin that's better because it has an articulated torso that is not default, but it has bugs can't see it in blender for example it doesn't react to light inside gs the right way seems faces are inverted somehow um okay i'm, I'm not sure what you're talking about lewis in terms of the mannequin if if it's uh if that's a mannequin i guess that's you're saying that's a mannequin inside gravity sketch um okay. We do have some like reference uh, import library mannequins. I think they're in. Maybe that's what Lewis but you're where? referring to, possibly, because um, we do have this mannequin that comes with Gravity Sketch that is articulated. Where, go over here to built-in models, and obviously you have the asset library, the reference library, but we also have this built-in models tab, um, and you can grab male and female mannequins here that you know you just click on it and it'll appear in your scene and those have joints and everything um so i can show you here actually on this one we have some pretty simple joints you know head joint um but if you want greater levels of control there's um you simply swipe on your joystick here and it'll go to a greater level of uh, control where you can move every single joint even all the fingers and that comes standard inside Gravity Sketch, and that should export as well. Also, you can bring in your own rigged models as FBX in Gravity Sketch, and you can actually manipulate those joints as well. So fun, fun little fact there. Um, yeah, like this, this one over here, Jaron, is one that yeah. I think we've added to the public asset library. Oh yeah, um, this is great. Like these in apparel are, they're, they're exactly what you're just describing, right? They're more like rigged models that you can do mesh deformation on and they still work the same way as the built-in uh like actual built-in prefab where i can move each of these points and it's a little bit jarring because you can like break <laughs> the bones <laughs> uh so you get some like strange things that could happen there yeah but uh they are pretty fun to play with because they do have like a higher resolution of that surface geometry and surface data than the, yeah, cool. uh, the built-in kind of clunk one it looks like it has like the blend, uh, polygon blending, which is really cool. The blend, blend, blend shapes. I think that's what you call it. Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty handy. It's pretty fun. Yeah, that's great. No, that's uh. Thanks for bringing that in. Yeah, that's a perfect example. Yeah, you can find that in our um, in the gallery as well. Uh, let me see here. Do you guys prefer to always sketch in Gravity Sketch, or do you still paper sketch? two or combine the two um personally i do both um it depends on the project and kind of how my brain's going um there's been a lot of projects where i've jumped straight into gravity sketch because a lot of uh, similar to what actually hunter was describing earlier where i feel like my sketch and gravity sketch is going to be more true to the final result than what i would do on paper um 
sometimes I will just start in 2D, like on my iPad, for example, because I just want to like, I like the gestural experience of my hand on a flat surface and just pumping out some little, little doodles, but it's really just for the fun of it. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. And, you know, we're not saying that people should stop doing that. I mean, that's like pretty essential, I think, in the creative process. Um, and uh, what I'll do oftenly, oftentimes is take those sketches directly in here and put them in side view and then start doing 2D or sorry, uh, like 3D sketches around those, um, those sketches I did in 2D. So that's typically how I work. I don't know how you work, Hunter, typically, but if you want to maybe yeah. touch on that. For sure. Yeah, I mean, that's something that it, it, I'm in the same boat, Jaren, where it kind of depends on the project. Uh, if I'm lost or if it's something very new to me, I will almost always jump straight into Gravity Sketch because it's much easier for me to understand what's happening when I'm here in app. Uh, that being said, right, like jumping in straight into Gravity Sketch doesn't always necessarily mean coming in here without any context. A lot of times if I'm working on like a new vehicle package uh, in automotive that I'm not already very familiar with, right? Like for instance, if I was designing a pickup truck and I'd never designed an actual pickup truck package before to a finalized extent, I would hop into Gravity Sketch and bring in my, uh, like like a, just an asset I would grab online of existing pickup truck models and start to evaluate it there. As far as like situations where I would do traditional 2D hand sketching, that's more something I say for if I'm already familiar with the topic or with the subject and it's truly just trying to like get thoughts out of my head. And I still do, uh, like I don't want to act like I don't have a sketchbook, right? Like everybody has a sketchbook and everybody should have a sketchbook. Um, there's a certain kind of just go anywhere, do it anytime freedom associated with that, but it's less trying to dial in really clean sketches. Uh, like, like, I don't know if this is a, I actually am pretty sure this is not an industry wide term, but when we were at UC, they used to refer to everything as thumbnail type A, type B, type C sketches. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of improving in quality from thumbnail where it's just really rough trying to get an idea uh, type a where you're starting to resolve some of the details type B where it's pretty much a finished line drawing and then type C where it's fully sketch rendered. And I kind of have uh, shifted my workflow to be almost all thumbnails in 2d. Uh, if I'm doing 2d, I'll do it all thumbnails. And then as I shift over into 3d, that's where I get more detailed. That's where I think through those because it's just so much more conducive to that process to actually be able to see things in 3D, right? It just makes more sense that way. I think at the end of the day, it's all about what's most efficient and what's going to help me get the best result out at the end. Um, a lot of times in design, I think there's something that like I have struggled with personally in, in more of the theory side of design is the idea that just because something looks good on paper doesn't mean it's a good it's a good design for a product or for a vehicle. Uh, just because it's a, a nice sketch, like dissociating the value of a nice sketch from the value of a nice design is something that is pretty hard to learn, right? It takes a lot of time to figure out that delineation, especially where it sits for you personally. And there have been times where I've picked a direction just because the sketch has nicer line weight or better perspective than another sketch. Uh, that's why I like being in here now because I get to eliminate all of that. Like sure, there are levels of execution that I can go to, but at the end of the day, the volume is there. I have so much more information to go off of than I would if I were only doing uh, 2D assets. Yeah. I'm sure that was, that was a lot of information. No, that was, no, that was, that was great. <laughs> no, that was really good. Um, yeah, I would, I would say, you know, just as a, as a, as a period to that, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's truly, you know, whatever, um, whatever process you and you, you know, works for you, honestly. And I know that's like a super cliche, cliche thing to say, but I mean, it's really the truth. <laughs> um, yeah. so yeah. it's like that in the industry too. Like of all of the people I've worked with that I've, I've taught gravity sketch or I've shown them the tool for the first time. Uh, one thing that's awesome about the design industry is that very rarely will you have management or somebody who's um, kind of in control of your process that tells you you have to do it one way or another. 
you know, they might say, okay, at the end of the day, we need this kind of file or, or this kind of format to communicate with the rest of the team. But that doesn't mean you have to come up with your ideation or your intent in that format that they still give you the freedom associated. And that's one of the great things about the design industry as a whole is that at the end of the day, uh, the way that you're coming up with these ideas doesn't really matter. Uh, what matters is the quality of the ideas and the way yeah. that you're able to execute on those ideas and the clarity of thought that you yep. have with that concept to start with. Yep. That's it. That's a really good one. I think that's like, if there's any takeaway, I think it would be that honestly, because I think a lot of times get really, really sucked into the tool, you know, or like, what's the right tool? Um, and this, this concept of like, you know, what's the idea to me is reflected in like multiple areas. Like, uh, you know, even with AI, it's like, okay, you can type something in a prompt, but you know, if the idea is crap, then, you know, it's, it, yeah. you know, what's the point? You know, it's like, it, I think you still, you still have to get to that, that, that seed, you know, that nugget. Yeah. Like you might be left with a nice visual very quickly. Right. And back where the value of that really comes from, at least in, in my mind, and AI is a super hot topic yeah. uh, in terms of like people feeling very strongly about it. Um, but just to throw my hat in the ring, like it's more about the thoughts that it spurs, because at the end of the day, if you don't have clarity of vision, you're not going to be able to deliver that. Right. That's the thing that they didn't, I, I never knew this when I was going into the design field before I started working with people, but, uh, it's not about always having the best design. It's about being able to communicate a design as effectively as possible uh, because if you have the best design in the world but you've got you know a horrible sketch of it or you've got these visuals that are conflicting it's not going to lead to anything and at the end of the day there's no real result to that and sure if you work completely independent of everybody else that communication is a little bit less important but i can probably count on a single hand how many design workflows i've seen where people don't interact with each other and there's no feedback and collaboration um, that's kind of just as we're on here talking about like, oh, this is what Gravity Sketch is good at. The collaboration side of it is also really valuable in here because instead of sketching in 2D or, or doing a rendering and sending it to somebody, we can collaborate as we're talking through it and as we're working on it. So like if I wanted to run over here and look at this, look at this format that Jaren has built out and I was like, oh, we've got, you know, maybe we want to add more volume like right down here to mimic this kind of outer shape inward. Like we can talk about that and we can see if there's validity in that idea and there may or may not be, but uh, we can catch that yeah. and talk about it in a non like micromanagement style. Yeah. That's a really good point. I honestly didn't even think about that, but uh, you know, when I've, you know, I've thought through collab before, but that's such like a small like thing, but so big. It yeah. like, like you'd think it's a small thing, but I think it's super important in the uh, collaboration process. And, yeah, like it feels um, so natural and normal in here that you don't even think about it. <laughs> for sure, <laughs> it is yeah. Well, kind of a, a crazy difference to the traditional process. Ways I've described it before is like, I feel like I'm just in the studio. Like, you know, like I'm in the design studio and, you know, it's what I'll do when I'm in the studio. Like, I'll come over here. Like, let's, you know, like legitimately I'm taking a pause. I'm like, I want to see what you're working on and it looks sick. Like, that's my first reaction. And... But I, but I feel like I can just, yeah, come over and be like, oh, like, when it, what's your thinking here, like in the shoulder? Um, you know, like, what are these, you know, circular details in the back? You know, what's that? And, and we can talk about it, you know? And so, uh, and I'm not, it's, it's just way more intimate in a very constructive way. That's the best way I can yeah. put it, I feel like, in my own words. But yeah, there's less less focus on like a final polished thing and more focus on ideas is really what it comes down to for me personally. Yeah. And that's a really hard thing to, to do, 
right? Because even if you're doing a traditional workflow and you tell somebody, hey, like, don't judge this by the way it looks, let's like talk about this together. There's always going to be that, uh, like, oh God, what's the right word? That, I don't wanna say judgment, but uh, that interpretation side, right? Like if something's not perfect in a 2D sketch, it confuses and it, and it kind of gums up the communication. Whereas in here, like if we want to talk about something, we can just sketch it in 3D and it's like, okay, I'm not putting all my mental focus into making this look good in perspective. I'm actually sketching something in 3D so that we can understand it. And, and it's much more intuitive that way. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Jaren, do you mind uh, unlocking this mannequin? Sure. Yeah. I'm going to change the color of it to be kind of this uh, yeah. bluish gray so it looks a little bit more like the still suit. Perfect. Thank you. Let's see. Great workflow, guys. Uses so many uses. I've been exploring workflows, and it's amazing how it fits in and has become an essential tool, in my opinion, most especially in the beginning of the process. That's awesome to hear. Great. Great for sharing with us. Yeah, that's really cool. I'm curious what, uh, what industry they're coming from. Yeah, this is Motion mm -hmm. Reel Incorporated. So, yeah, I'm, ass nice. I'm assuming maybe motion motion graphics, motion design. Um, but, yeah, let us know. They were easier to find before the update. Look, took me a minute to find them again. Let's see. Thanks for your thoughts, guys. Much appreciated. Just another question. How do you think Gravity Sketch helps you in the early phases of design when concepts are usually still ambiguous and sometimes still ambiguity can be a good thing? Yeah, I think we've touched on that a little bit. Um, but yeah, I think it all goes back to it takes a lot of that pressure off um, just in the, in the early phase, in the early steps. It just really, I think that it just allows you to play with ideas um, I don't know for me, I don't know if what it was for you, Hunter, but whenever I would jump into a tool, like, you know, I don't want to name a, name a tool, but just like, like a 3D, traditional, like 2D, 3D tool. I, I realize that's a, a 3D tool that's like on a 2D screen is what I mean to say. And yeah. when I would jump in there, like, I feel like I would have to have my idea really fleshed out or pretty, pretty solid. Um, and I, didn't feel like a lot of freedom to explore. And maybe that's just because I was still fairly new using a tool. But I think to get to the point where you're such a pro that you can just kind of play with ideas, I think that just takes years for most of these like um, professional, you know, 3D tools that are on, on computers. Um, whereas with Gravity Sketch, it's really like a thinking tool for me. Um, and a communication tool, obviously, but it's truly like takes all that pressure off, like I said before, and like Hunter's been describing, like it's it, it really um, allows me to just put something down, even with the volume tool, it's a perfect example. Like I've been basically working fully with volume tool this entire time, and now I'm gonna start moving into some like basic sub D, but you know, this is just, me seeing like, is this a good idea? I don't know. You know, is this something that is actually compelling without having to spend hours even just representing it in 3D? Um, you know, we've, I don't know how long we've been going. We've been going for an hour now, actually, which is crazy. And, but, but all things considered, I mean, that's pretty quick. I mean, I have a 3D shape here. Normally, if I'm by myself, I probably would have done like multiples of these you know, because I can basically copy this off, do another one, and just see, you know, is this like, you know, get, get, get a few a few ideas going. Um, whereas, you know, I think it's just a little bit harder to do that with some other tools. I think other tools are stronger for creating, moving things down the pipeline, you know, uh, in, in the design process, you know, making it making it, uh, you know, ready for like full scale production, making it, um, you know, making it asset ready. 
I will say that there is a lot of uh, ways that you can make things ready for production in Gravity Sketch in, in certain industries, in certain cases, because we've seen that in our community. Um, there's a company called Spot that basically designed an entire vehicle in Gravity Sketch and then milled it in clay, and it went straight to production from, from there. Um, I believe there was some like minor awesome. adjustment, and I, I think there was some minor adjustment in Alias, but it was, I mean, it was extremely minor. It really was, Gravity Sketch did most of the heavy lifting in terms of 3D. So, you know, it's possible, um, you know, entertainment industry, we've seen, um, assets that are taken directly from gravity sketch that end up being the final asset in, um, you know, in film or in games. And so, um, I think it's just however far you want to take it, you know, that was a really, yeah. long, really, really long winded answer, but <laughs> yeah. No, I think, I think that's a really good point right i mean when i'm in gravity sketch um i don't see gravity sketch as necessarily like that's what takes all the pressure off for me i guess is that i don't see gravity sketch as a hyper uh complex tool um the, the simpleness of it is what makes things so easy and i don't think of gravity sketch as like a final execution tool i mean it definitely can be but like you're saying uh but it's at the end of the day, what's more important to me and what this tool is great at in a way that other tools aren't is intent clarification. Um, just finding out what you want to do. And so in a lot of ways, it's become my sketchbook, right? Like if I, if I start from 2D, I might find some like graphical intent, but a lot of that form intent is pretty hard to ideate on in 2D in a meaningful way, at least, or in, in a similar way to, uh, you know, what's going to actually be useful in the end. So I always start here and the, uh, the format that I use that I think is really conducive to that early stage ideation is let's say I got to a point, which I'm not really there yet, but let's just throw some like random stuff on here and pretend like, okay, this is one concept that I have for a, uh, for a character design or, or suit design. If I lock my reference images or lock my reference data, and then I just kind of click and drag that upward. Oh, sorry, I took the ground plane too. Uh, but if I do that, I'm able to then take that information and sketch on it in another iteration. And if I go back and you know redline it and change certain things, change features and formats that I'm not liking, at the end of the day, I'm left with this almost like assembly line of my thought process, mm -hmm. which especially in those earlier iterative processes is invaluable yeah. uh, because in the same, it's, it's basically just keeping a record of everything I'm thinking through and it's all evaluated or able to be kind of thought through at the same extent as every other piece in here. And so you don't lose those ideas that have legs. Uh, you can go back and grab them and bring them back on. But in this case, like, I kind of like this one that I'm playing with. I, I might start texturing it and playing with it a little bit more. But basically, I've kind of like taken that that almost tessellated shape of the uh, the orthopter, orthopter. Yeah, orthopter. Yeah. yeah, I've basically taken the uh, like the tessellated shape of that and just kind of carried it through to almost like a borderline masterpiece suit of armor. <laughs> I think I got a <laughs> yeah. little bit of Halo inspiration in there. But uh, yeah. you can you can take it through and get an idea that like I would have never drawn this in 2D to this level. Um, I would have never like been thinking through some of the different ergonomic things that I was thinking through from a human factors perspective. Like that's incredibly valuable in itself. Just the fact that like I'm thinking about the different cuts and these different panelings. And I could do that in 2D. I could do that in other tools. But uh, not in the same way, at least not personally. Yeah, I like we said earlier too. Like it's it turns into this like assembly line of ideas. Like it, that, it's partially a. Um, what's funny about that is it's it's a partially a byproduct of the tool in that you can't move the mirror plane, and, but I love what it's done because every time I've gone and looked at like, you know, a, a customer's room you know and like, like a demo or done some stuff with the community or just yeah jumping into, into rooms that that all of you out there have like created and, and and 
looking at what you've you've made it turns into this like assembly line of ideas like you said hunter and i just love it like it, i love it because it's like i'm diving into their brain into their thought process and literally seeing in front of me um that evolution of the idea and it just connects in a way that i think is hard to connect any other way um to you know in getting to an idea uh, more, more intuitively and more succinctly more um more powerfully too um, for sure let's see great guys and an awesome time to get into guys here right now oh motion motion reel uh, they say I'm a motion designer by trade and also a gravity sketch instructor. I own Motion Real Academy, friends with Nick Gravely and Eric Stoddard, who trained me. Great. Nice. <laughs> Super cool. Best, the best, the best. So, well, it's a pleasure to meet you and glad you're joining us. Um, go bigger on the blades. That's what Mac McMillan says. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm up. I'll do it. I'll do it, Mac. That's all I need to hear. That's, a, <laughs> that's official design direction. All right. I guess I got to do it. <laughs> uh, I have to do it then. Management hopped in the chat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's Mac McMillan. He's on the Gravity Sketch team. Okay. I agree. They do need to be bigger. I, I want to um, figure out what sort of shape these have. Let's see. They probably need to have a bit of a bigger surface area on the ends because they do serve as like a, they do serve as a blade for air. Yeah, in all, in all serious, in all, in all reality, they probably do need to be really large actually. There was actually, there was someone that did a video on the ornithopter blades and how big they would need to be for, uh, to actually, you know, move something of that size. And yeah, they have, they would have to be like way bigger, like than, than they're shown in the movie. Um, I wasn't surprised. I mean, cause that's, you know, yeah. Right. If, it, if it was possible, we'd make it in real life. Yeah. That's the that's the phi uh, the phi part of sci-fi, right? That's where it gets fun. That is that is really cool though. I remember seeing a, uh, it, it's kind of in the same vein, but it's a little less like producty. It was like a Dungeons and Dragons video on YouTube where they were looking through like different lore of real life uh, dragons and things like that in different cultures. Oh yeah. And they did an analysis of like how large. The wings would have to be to lift something of a certain mass and apparently like after a certain size it becomes next to impossible uh so it's it's very yeah. interesting like certain birds and things that are large and they're basically like right on that threshold of being able to provide enough physical lift with the muscle mass associated to create it it's really interesting wow that actually is fascinating <laughs> strange rabbit holes on youtube but. Yeah. Oh, trust me. I know. <laughs> Hopefully this is a, a, const a constructive rabbit hole for all of you watching on YouTube. Yeah. In case you ever wanted to know about flight physics <laughs> um, with no actual details. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's see if I can get this to a place where I'm ready to really need to figure out this tail section I think I've got it I'm trying not to make it look too aesthetically pleasing because you know after all it is kind of it is built by you know these people that live in the desert that really all things considered live pretty simple lives you know I'm not sure they're 
too concerned about aesthetics. You know, they're more so concerned about function and survival. And so you can't have something that's too, you know, designed, if you will. For sure. But it's gotta look a little bit cool, I think. Gotta have the visual intrigue. Hey, maybe they have a maybe they have a design oriented person in their community, you know? <laughs> True. True. So maybe you can use that lot. As long as there is a storytelling aspect behind it, I think it makes sense. Yeah. I think I'm just just about done with the my thought here. And then I think it should be time to really solidify some of this, some of this stuff. Sure. I'm over here, I'm starting to like kind of pose my character a little bit. Just by baking some of these different mirrors that I have in here and posing and moving everything in place. Oh, sweet. Oh, that's awesome. It's funny because a lot of the stuff that I initially built is like very stiff because I was doing kind of just like a, not even a T-pose, but like that kind of straight format. Now when I do this, I think it's going to bring it a little bit more to life. I'm gonna take an element of this fin that I have in the back and continue that. Continue that a bit. I'm gonna have to I think we'll say that that's it so I can I can keep messing with shapes all day long at some point I have to move it forward So we've got our, hmm, what should we call this? I wonder. 
Crazy. When I think of a pun, nothing's coming to mind. <laughs> yeah, originally when I was going to do like the bike with the wheel, I was going to call it like a dune runner, but it's like very, very derivative. Almost need something. Yeah, a little more, a little bit more of a pun to it, I feel like. this shape here. Nice. There's all kinds of really cool details I could get into with this. For sure. Yeah, I'm kind of playing with some different like scene setting things over here with just volume tool and trying to build out some of that. Interesting. All right. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to hide this a little bit. Change this color to be a little bit lighter. And then on a new layer, I'm gonna start creating some, some basic shapes here. Poly as well. So I'm just grab that. I really want like a paneled kind of look to it. So these will be like separate, like separate pieces, I would, I would say. This is the part of the design process where you just like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, just putting your head down and getting stuff. Yeah, you kind of just zone out. And uh, it's, it's tricky when um, it's tricky when you're doing live like this, because in the design process, ideally you get into like, you know, that flow state, right? Yeah, which is exactly 
like when you get quiet. <laughs> yeah, it's the opposite of like doing a live, you know, and trying to explain, you know, your thought process and, um, but you know, we're all, we're all comfortable here, I think. And I'm just being, being honest about where I'm at. Let's see. For sure. I think it'd be cool to make a nice transition with the sphere, this polygonal, um, form, but I think for now we'll just We'll stick with like a good old sphere and then we'll figure that out at a later point. So we'll just stick it there. Put the other one there. And then we do have what I would think would be like the instrument panel. So I think it would be pretty, pretty simple, something like this. And Something like that. Okay. Extrude that. Connect those together. Do a quick selection here and set and set that. I'll check the comments too in a minute. I'm sure there's probably some. Yeah, I'm kind of doing a little bit of like scene building pedestal platform for this guy over here right now. Oh, Him perfect. walking through the stand. And like to your point about just like being on the live and everything, I think normally I would uh, probably take the servicing further before I got to where this is right now. Yeah. But you can definitely, like that's the beauty of it is that you don't have to get crazy you don't have to get everything perfect yeah. it's it's a sketch right it's it's exactly. meant to be communication of idea so i've got like this guy walking through the sand over here with some like sand gusts and footprints behind him yeah it's it's yeah we're not we're definitely not going for perfection here we're just trying to convey convey some ideas and Maybe get something cool out of it. Same here. I would definitely take this a lot further if it was just me right now. But I think that... That's the beauty of having an audience. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you, get to, you get to do things faster. You're forced to have an outcome, which is never a bad thing. No, it's actually good. It does force you to have, yeah, to have a result. Um, and yeah, sometimes being alone can, you can kind of get into this place where you just continue playing around and it's not even bad to play. It's just like, um, I don't know. I think it, I think sometimes you can get into a decision spiral. Yeah. Yeah, or you can end up in kind of a uh, an echo chamber of your own thoughts. And so whereas us talking through something and, and getting a sounding board leading might lead to a better result, uh, if you're all alone, sometimes you go down a, a rabbit hole that doesn't really lead to anything. Yeah, exactly. 
can hide this and see what this is looking like so far. The nice thing about the Dune aesthetic is that you don't need like a lot of crazy materials and colors. <laughs> it's yeah. pretty much all just gray, dark, dusty. Yeah, it's more of like a almost like monotone, but extremely heavy texture aesthetic. Yes. Sand. So I'm kind of liking this is going. So now I'm really motivated to like get this represent, get this presentable. The thicken tool really helps a lot. It'll speed things up. Too. Yeah, it does. Yes, it does. Oh, this is looking sick. Thanks, man. This is looking super cool. I love the uh, like the wispiness of that center seating area. Like just how thin it is. Feels very efficient. Yeah, like I was trying to. I was trying to convey something because, like, back to what I was saying earlier, like, I don't want something that's too pretty, but something that's just yeah. kind of, like, feels more functional and almost, almost at, like, almost at a fault in a way to where, it, like, it feels a little bit too rudimentary, and I, it, but in a beautiful way. Like, if I could, like, achieve that, that's kind of what I was trying to do. Um, yeah. So if it feels like that i feel like that's that's a success to me because I'm, I'm trying to i'm trying to put my set myself in the head of a fremen you know yeah yeah yeah. it's like you, you need something functional yeah nobody nobody's gonna be giving you any awards for it looking a certain way right yeah it's like what do you got what do you need to make it out of i went ahead and uh hit some of that reference imagery over here heads up oh perfect yeah that'll clean things up at this point I'm just like making panels and just thickening them I'm going to take some instant photos in here. See if I can't uh, get some cool output.
that's what I wanted. I noticed that there were these sort of like these ribbed things on the uh, on the wings of the ornithopters, and so I'm going to try and replicate that just a little bit. Sure. Definitely not. Yeah, that's cool. Some of that different like ribbing and ridge that goes on with the, uh, let me actually pull that image back on here. All right, I'm gonna try and really speed this up because I kind of have to hop out soon. <laughs> Good. But um, I want to get it to a place where it's like I'm conveying my idea. I just want to say that I finished it. That's all. <laughs> you know. For sure. Okay. I'll check comments real quick too. Um. Yeah, Mac Mac saying some good stuff. Maybe put everyone on a level playing field. Let me jump. I'm gonna go ahead and move this guy over by you too. Give him like. Yeah, great points, Mac. Context. Thanks for. Thanks for jumping in the comments there. I think those are some good points. Oh, yeah, perfect, yeah. Getting everything together. For sure. This, I really could see this. Like, I could really see this in the in the films. Yeah, it's super fun. Honestly, I love it. But... I mean, if you're done, like, let me just... Because I don't want to hold everybody hostage. I'm just going to make all these the same material and let's see here because i mean my, my idea more or less is is expressed here um yeah you got all the know. volume and everything so even though i wanted to do some sub d sub d it's really gonna look pretty much pretty similar to what i have here with volume tool um yeah. although i am glad i did it on the front end because i think that needed a little bit more definition but I think just to really bring this home, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get some, uh, I'm going to get some red, and I'm just going to draw on some, some basic little like UI on the uh, on the panel here. That's sick. I want to. I want to hop on and ride this thing, man. <laughs> it's super cool. Okay. So. I feel like I need to steal some of these little rib pieces from the wings and throw them on my guy. This is this is really cool. This is actually exceeds my expectations and my hopes for for today <laughs> i gotta say i'm gonna i'll delete uh, i'm gonna delete this back here Oop. get rid of this guy uh oh uh -oh. lost him did i do that i uh i think so i can't undo it but i didn't even i didn't even touch it that's super strange let's see is it just not there yeah, it's not letting me undo it. 
That is what in the world? Wait a I minute. think it was like linked to something. Maybe it's on a different layer. Whoa. Oh no. I'm pressing the undo button and it's not. That's... Yeah, I see it clicking. I'm even undoing the clock. <laughs> I can't believe that just happened. <laughs> oh my gosh. We've got a record. It's all on video. Yeah, you guys saw it. I mean, <laughs> that's a bummer. All my layers are on. Oh no, I'm so sorry, Hunter. That's it's all good. Well, what did I? It's all good. I, I, I took grab? screenshots early. I just grabbed. I didn't even touch it because I grabbed like my old vehicle. That's what I deleted. I think I, I think it had gotten like, grouped between multiple layers and multiple people's items. Okay. Like, because I think I grouped it with that ground plane that you had put in initially. Oh. I'm wondering if that ground plane was grouped to something, and then since it was like subgrouped, it's confusing the software. But oh, could yeah. revert. To an earlier file version Shoot. if we wanted to get it back, but that's all right. Yeah, you think it's saved in the meta, meta data? Yeah, it would be. It would be, but it's Man, all good. I took screenshots. That, you took <laughs> okay. Gl I'm glad because I wanted to get like a final shot. All right. Apologies, everyone. That was a <laughs> big my bad. Sorry, Hunter. All good. Definitely didn't expect that to happen, but you know. Here we are. Um, time to uninstall Gravity Sketch. That's what someone said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. stuff happens. Um, but you all saw it, and uh, yeah, we have the we have the the vehicle here still. Great. <laughs> um, but what I will say is, Hunter said that if you want to get your file back, it is in the. It should be in the. Um, any auto saves? Yeah. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, it's just, yeah. Well, I was hoping to get a final shot. Maybe we should, let's see if we can maybe do that offline, Hunter, and see if we can get like a cool final shot. Um, yeah. But, yeah, uh, Hunter, I just want to say thank you, man, for, for dedicating a good portion of your day to this and uh, sure. doing, a, doing this live demo. And thank you, everybody out there, for watching us and just sitting with us through the process of, creating and designing the, the, you know, sometimes it can be kind of boring, but we want to be honest about what that looks like. So, um, I think that Hunter, you gave a lot of great nuggets today of, of wisdom. And I think with design and how to approach and express your ideas, I hope that all of you learned a little bit of something today. Um, so we, we do have the, the vehicle here. Unfortunately, I like, I can't give a final shot of Hunter's creation. It was pretty dope. Uh, but he created a suit that had armor on it that the Fremen would uh, would bring together. And so I think most of you uh, did see it. And I was going to do like a walkthrough. I wanted you to explain it. Um, yeah. Shoot. Man, that's that's trying to see if I can find that, that screenshot. I know I took him as uh, yeah, if some, you, some photos. Yeah, if, you, could, if so. you feel like you could bring that in, like I, I'd love to maybe just have a look at that if you can. But um, yeah. if it's... Yeah, let me see. Well, we can hang for it for a minute. Yeah, let me see if I can grab it here. I don't know where I'm looking for it. Yeah, I've got it on my... Uh, on my desktop. Let's see. I'll drop it over into my personal folder. There we go. Probably looks like I'm not doing anything because I'm like hovering my headset. No, you're good, you're good. <laughs> I am grabbing it. Let's see. Should be uploading. All right. 
here. Yeah, I think that was. Um... Oh well, my headset just shut off. Probably just there we go. It, okay. You just have to wake it up again. Yeah. tracking okay yeah let me restart my headset here i might be able to just throw them in the uh in the group let's see yeah maybe i can grab it um yeah because i see your folder for live sketch reference so i'll just drop them in there See if I can bring it in. Just let me know when it's in there. Yep. They're uploading now. Cool. I think my uh, headset might have overheated because I'm sitting here in the sunshine. With my face plate on my headset that's black, which probably isn't the best thing for uh, heat dissipation. <laughs> Alright, you got some cool shots here. Shoot. I got, I got the one where it's like looking down on it that uh, has the the sand kind of like transparent i think that's the one i like the most that feels very like cinematic i think yeah, it just finished some, uploading that's some sweet shots man thank you yeah, we got to get this file back yeah all right so do you uh, want to talk just a little bit about fun. this or you're still yeah. restarting yeah i'm hopping back in right now so um I'll be in there in about i seconds. i love the it's definitely looks like they took parts from like a a Trades, um, a Trades like hardware for sure, because like a Trades stuff is like very polygonal, and very rudimentary. Um, I mean, it totally fits within the universe. To me, it looks like. Um, it, to me, it looks like a, just something I would see like in part three, probably. Thanks, to be man. honest. Yeah. This is yeah, great. I mean. What I was thinking uh, for, let me see if I can grab the uh, actual, actually it's over here, I'll just kind of grab it. Yeah, I was thinking like basically the most recognizable thing as far as the form factor for me with the, uh, with the ornithopter is kind of this idea of like the, the sharp kind of like hood down, almost looks like a, like a bug jaw for lack of a better yeah. statement, right? Where it's kind of like coming down, chomping over top. So I was trying to keep that kind of feel of very top heavy and then slanting down and in. And what's interesting is like, there's no, there's nothing that would be like this piece that would come directly off of that. But I think it's kind of interesting to take the same cut paneling and then like assume that you could break it down and, and reassemble it in a different way. Yeah. But yeah, that's like kind of the thought process of it is that it's basically just an overlay to the still suits built from wreckage of these kinds of vehicles whether it's the you know i mean we saw in part one and, and in part two like there's a lot of things that get broken up in the desert and that kind of exist out there yeah and they might like shift down onto the sand but they'll be revealed back as time comes and goes and so taking that material that's been designed and like extensively engineered and then repurposing it is kind of a no-brainer especially for a group like the fremen right so yeah if they're taking that and they're they're kind of being even when they're at the worms right they don't really have like additional protection so the idea of like an additional protective suit but then keeping in like you gotta have the scarf and all the fabrics and everything that they're creating on there and kind of integrated into it so yeah yeah it's just, it's just beautiful man this this fits right into the universe you even had some footstep imprints ah, man i'm so glad i'm so mad that that got erased We'll have to grab that in post, but um, for sure, man, this is great, great work, awesome. Um, this is like better than what I would have hoped for today. So, and as you can see, all of you have been watching along as I've been creating this. So I don't know if I really need to explain very much, but obviously it's operated by uh, the you know similar technology that the ornith ornithopters use, and you know we have like a little bit of a HUD display, and I, I imagine this sort of this uh, this piece in the bottom is kind of how the vehicle rests when it's uh, when it's not in use so like for example if i just group that 
and then I'm just gonna just gonna do like a little rotate. Um, you know, it kind of would sit like this, I would yeah. imagine. That's and, super cool. And then these would probably, you know, they would probably be resting at you know in this position, I would guess. And then the rider would hop on. These would start flapping, and then it would just kind of take off. Like it's pretty pretty rugged and uh and rudimentary is is how i imagine the functionality would be for it so because this was this is sure. technically made of found parts that was kind of like my thinking behind it but um i but love yeah. that format of it being on the ground because there's something really satisfying and also logical about the fact that there's like no large panels that could catch wind it's not like it's going, always going to be in place there's not a lot of volume for sand to build up on yeah and it's still got that like kind of like almost ramp aesthetic of things flying off of it. And I could see like an animation of this, you know, mm -hmm. coming up and like flapping off the sand and then like buzzing away. Oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think we, I think we did a good job today, Hunter. I think, uh, I think we made something for the, for the universe. So if anybody from the production team is watching the design team, you know, there you go. Some free, some free ideas for you. <laughs> yeah. What, what happened to that little hand that we, uh, that we put into the call. <laughs> oh yeah. The call sign. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. We need to get that. Um, well, another thing too is hopefully we can get someone from, uh, that actually worked on the films, uh, as a, as a, as a guest soon. Um, we've been speaking with someone that we may be able to uh, speak with. So keep your eyes out for that. Um, for everybody watching, we may have someone that actually worked in the films. Uh, come and join us at a future date. So um, definitely stay tuned. May or may not happen. I don't want to make any promises, but there's there's some conversation happening. So, um, but I just want to thank everybody for their time and watching and, and joining us today. Thank you again, Hunter. Really appreciate your time today. And Absolutely. tune in for the next one. We've got a, a new challenge coming up. So stay tuned for that. Um, you know definitely like join in those challenges and submit stuff where we're, we love seeing the stuff you create it's hashtag gravity sketch challenge and uh yeah and and any, any ideas you have out there for the community um if you guys want to see us do something specific for these live sketches just let us know send us a message so with that we appreciate you all and thank you all very much have a good rest of your yeah. tuesday thank you see ya